Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'd. Let us begin by looking at what people said about Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala. Yesterday we looked at what his teachers said. Uh, Ibn Hajar next looks at what his peers said. So all of his fellow students, people of the same generation, what did they say about him? That tells you a lot about a person as well. Obviously, what a teacher says about a student is much more valuable, but so uh, is um, so are the fellow experts of his time and his generation. So Abu Hatim al-Razi, for instance, great hadith expert, he's roughly from the generation of Bukhari, from the same region, he said, لم تخرج خراسان لم تخرج خراسان قط أحفظ من محمد بن إسماعيل ولا قدم منها إلى العراق أعلم منه أبو حاتم الرازي we see his name all the time in hadith sciences um, he says خراسان did not produce anyone like Muhammad bin Ismail nor did anyone come into Iraq from outside of it who was more knowledgeable than him Ad-Darimi, another great scholar who has Musnad, he has his own book of Hadith. He says, قَدْ رَأَيْتُ الْعُلَمَاءِ بِالْحَرَمَيْنِ وَالْحِجَازِ وَالشَّامِ وَالْعِرَاقِ فَمَا رَأَيْتُ فِيهِمْ أَجْمَعْ مِنْ مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ إِسْمَعِيلِ He said, I saw scholars all over the world, in the Haramain, Arabia, in Sham, in Iraq, but I've never seen anyone who's more comprehensive in knowledge than Muhammad bin Ismail. He also said, هُوَ أَعْلَمُنَا وَأَفْقَهُنَا وَأَكْثَرُنَا طَلَبًا He was the most knowledgeable of all of us. He was the most learned of all of us and the most, uh, had the most zeal in knowledge uh, from all of us. Uh, so he has a lot of praise for Imam al-Bukhari and that's a darimi That's one of the nine. If you expand the six books to nine, so what the six books we all know, what are the additional three that you can add? Then it becomes the nine books. Who knows? Musnad Ahmad. What else? Darimi, the Musnad Darimi or Sunan Darimi. And then there's a third, which we, we talked about a lot. Muatta. Yeah, Muatta. So the reason Muatta is not part of the six is because Muatta is part of Bukhari anyway, most of it. So it is the soundest book. So the people who could pick you know, included the six, they did it for utility purposes. <clears throat> Had they included the Muatta, it's not adding a lot because Muatta is a previous work, it's one of the earliest work, it was absorbed mostly into the later works. Ibn Khuzayma, another great muhaddid, um, he said, مَا تَحْتَ أَدِيمِ السَّمَاءَ أَعْلَمْ بِالْحَدِيثِ مِنْ مُحَمَّدْ بِنْ إِسْمَعِيلِ Muhammad ibn Ismail. Under the canopy of the sky, there is none that is more learned in hadith than Muhammad ibn Ismail. So, so far, all these are big names. You might say, well, the peers, the fellow students, they're not as great as teachers, but look at these names. Abu Hatim al-Razi, Abdarimi, Ibn Khuzayma, Imam al-Tirmidhi, from his fellow generation, from his students. Imam al-Tirmidhi, he says, Lam ara a'lam bil'ilal wal-asaneed min Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari. I've never met anyone who's more knowledgeable in the defects of the hadith and more knowledgeable on the chains of hadith than Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari. Um, and that's, that's a great testament because Tirmidhi is also a great scholar and he's a student of, of, of Imam al-Bukhari. And if you read the Sunan of, or the Jamir of Imam al-Tirmidhi, you know, it's written with a different purpose in mind and I alluded to that many, many times. But often after hadith in Tirmidhi, he quotes opinions of fiqh and he quotes other scholars and often one of his most widely quoted scholars is Imam al-Bukhari but people are thrown off because he doesn't say Qal al-Bukhari that's a much later appellation because al-Bukhari means you're from Bukhara Bukhara is full of hadith scholars so at that time we say al-Bukhari it doesn't mean much it means the man from Bukhara or the scholar from such and such right so his name is Kunya was Abu Abdullah. So 
often in hadith of Tirmidhi, he'll say, Qala Abu Abdullah, or Qala Abu Abdullah, or Sa'altu Aba Abdullah. Um, so that means Bukhari. So he's often quoting Bukhari and many of the hadith that he's quoting, and he's referencing his conversations with Imam al Bukhari, which shows you that he was studying and a student of Imam al Bukhari, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Uh, Abu Amar al Khufaf, he said, Haddathana at Taqi and Naqi al Alim, Alladhi lam ara mithlahu Muhammad ibn Ismail. So we need to relate hadith from Bukhari. Um, he would say, Haddathana at Taqi, the pious one, and Naqi, the pure one, al Alim, the scholarly one, Alladhi lam ara mithlahu, the one who no one else seen has seen his like, Muhammad ibn Ismail. And he used to say, وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْحَدِيثِ مِنْ أَحْمَدْ وَإِسْحَاقِ وَغَيْرِهِمَا He even used to say he's even more knowledgeable than Imam Ahmad and Ishaq ibn Rahaway, two of his teachers. بِعْشْرِينَ دَرَجَةً with 20 degrees. وَمَنْ قَالَ فِيهِ شَيْءٍ فَعَلَيْهِ مِنِّي أَلْفْ لَعْنَةً He said, whoever says anything about Bukhari, from me there are a thousand curses upon him. So it just shows you, you know, some of these are emotional statements. Um, but it shows you the steam that he had in the minds of many people of his generation. Abdullah ibn Hamad al Abali, he said, Lawadatu anni kuntu sha'ratan fi jasad Muhammad ibn Ismail. I wish I was a hair in the body of Muhammad ibn Ismail. Um, so Ibn Hajar ends, and I'll end with that. He's First, he shared. Um, praises of Imam al-Bukhari from his teachers and we covered many of them yesterday um, and we stopped we didn't cover all of them um, but then the next section he talks about the praise of Bukhari from his own generation and from his peers and he mentions many of these and then he ends by saying if we were to go on and share what people said about Bukhari after his generation he said then we would fill volumes and volumes and volumes and he said, there's no need to go there. Uh, why? Because لَيْسَ الْعَيَانُكَ الْخَبَرِ We said لَيْسَ الْعَيَانُكَ الْخَبَرِ It's an Arabic expression. Uh, the eye is not like the report. Yani, uh, seeing is not like hearing. So these people who were his teachers, they knew him because they saw him. And the people who were from his generation, from his peers, they saw him with their own eyes. For them to say something about him is much more valuable and then scholars coming after Imam al-Bukhari generations later who did speak about him, who did praise him immensely, but it's not the same. So Ibn Hajar suffices with the praise of Bukhari from his peers and from his teachers. And he doesn't go into those who came after him. Now, the last thing, what about Imam Muslim? Rahimahullah ta'ala. <clears throat> so Imam Muslim and Bukhari, there, you know, there's much that we can learn about the two of them. And there's much that has been said about them. And there's a lot of confusion and misunderstandings about their relationship. Because there's supposedly some type of rivalry, rivalry that built up between them. And there's a misconception. So Imam Muslim wrote a muqaddimah of his sahih, where he outlines his methodology and approach. So this is quite different from Imam al-Bukhari. Bukhari just jumps into the sahih. He doesn't give you, you know, an outline of what he's doing in his vision. Um, but Imam Muslim, he writes a muqaddimah that outlines his vision, outlines um, what he's thinking in compiling this book. And in that, he's criticizing some people very harshly. Um, so he criticizes a view in the opening that, you know, there was a, like, like when you have an isnad and a teacher and a student, um, some people stipulated that, you have to have positive proof that this person met that person. It's not enough that they were from the same time period. So he harshly criticizes that view. He says unrealistic and um, well, he doesn't say that, but that's his, his understanding. So a lot of people felt, or some people felt that he was criticizing Bukhari there. He doesn't mention the name. So he's, her, his words are quite harsh. So, uh, Imam al Dhahabi kind of falls into this trap, and so does Ibn Hajar. And both of them felt that Imam Muslim was criticizing Imam Bukhari and refuting him, not just criticizing, refuting his approach 
in the beginning of a Sahih. And then when you have that kind of misunderstanding, then, you know, like they say, when there's beef or supposed beef, then things get exaggerated and the masala starts happening. And so then all these people start talking, well, look, Muslim, he didn't like Bukhari. That's why there's not a single hadith he narrates from uh from Bukhari, even though that was a teacher, and they add all these details. So, so there's this understanding out there, uh, which is not true, but certainly that Bukhari and Muslim had differences, and Muslim was quite upset at Bukhari for some reason. And the people who research, the people who understand Imam al-Bukhari, who spent their lives studying him, um, all this deep research has debunked that. So that is not true. Uh, Imam Muslim was not referring to Imam al-Bukhari in that introduction, um, although many people do claim that he, he did. Because the fact is, Imam Bukhari and Muslim had the same methodology. Those same five conditions that we talked about, which I'm not going to ask you to repeat the line, I did that yesterday. So not a single student memorizes the lines. Um, and I've only been saying it again and again. But these five conditions of Sahih, um, they're the same conditions for Bukhari and Muslim. They're not different. So they had the same same conditions. Um, but it's just sometimes they had a different approach in the sense that um, they had different priorities. Like Imam al-Bukhari, dubbed was more important, the truth was more important than the morality or the the, the ideological leanings of, of, of the person. Whereas, which is adala or adal. Um, for Imam Muslim, adal was very important and maybe even more important than Dab. But they had the same conditions. So Sheikh Akram, for instance, um, he always quotes his teacher, um, Maulana Shah Abbas Islahi. He says he learned this from him that you know, Bukhari and Muslim were the same and Muslim was not speaking about Bukhari in his Muqaddimah. And that always settled in his mind and he always believed that. And then when he met the great Muhaddith and one of his teachers, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda of Syria, He's a great scholar. So Shaykh Akram always tells him, well, you know, one of my teachers used to say that Imam Muslim is not speaking about Bukhari and Muqaddimah, it's someone else. And Shaykh Abdul Fattah, he told Shaykh Akram that, well, I'm very, quite surprised that someone in India would have that because I have the same view. I've always felt that this is totally wrong. Ibn Hajar and Imam al Dahabi were, were off and the scholar that felt that Imam Muslim was criticizing Bukhari because so he was very happy to see that someone else shared this view of his. So, so that's what we need to understand. Imam Muslim was held Imam al-Bukhari in quite the esteem. Um, there's a famous incident where, and he spent quite a bit of time with Imam al-Bukhari. Um, so in one of the incidents, a fellow hadith scholar, he said, I saw Imam Bukhari was in one of his circles and Imam Muslim entered upon Bukhari. And he said, and he described what happened. The first thing Imam Muslim said to Bukhari, he said, Da'ni hatta uqabbila rijlayka ya ustad al-astadayn wa sayyid al-muhaddithin wa tabib, um, wa tabib al-haditha fi ilalihi. He said, um, he said some beautiful words to Imam Bukhari. He said, let me kiss your feet. O oh, teacher of teachers. O oh, master of all the muhaddithin. O oh, doctor of the hadith defects. So that's how much esteem he had of Imam al-Bukhari. And then he asked him about a hadith. There was a hadith, a specific hadith he asked him about. Imam Bukhari showed him the defect of that hadith. He was so impressed. And when he left, he said, لا يبغضك إلا حاسدا وأشهد أن ليس في الدنيا مثله. Now a Muslim said to Imam al-Bukhari, no one can hate you except the one who is jealous, who is afflicted by hasad. And I bear witness that there is no one in the world like you. So this is the reality of the relationship of Muslim and Bukhari. Bukhari, towards the end of his life, he ran into some trouble with another individual, a Dhuhli. And we're going to talk about the, some controversy developed. So a lot of people started accusing Bukhari of certain things. And he was forced to flee from the land. And Imam Muslim, so Dhuhli is a great muhaddith, one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari. But then they there developed a misunderstanding between them. And Imam Muslim at that time was studying with Zuhli and Imam al-Bukhari. Um, so when that happened and he forced Bukhari to leave, so Imam Muslim, what he did was, 
he was loyal to Bukhari. So he went to the teacher, Dhuhli, he gave all his books back. All the books, that, all the hadith that he learned from him, he returned it to him. And he said, I'm leaving. So he left that teacher for good. And he went with Bukhari and left the land. So someone like that, who have the same vision, the same trajectory, when you look at both works, there's so many hadith they agree upon. That means they have the same general methodology. It's not, it cannot be the case that they were rivals or Imam Muslim had something in his heart against Imam al-Bukhari. The final thing that can be said about this is, okay, so there's a question. So in Sahih Muslim, why is there not a single hadith that Muslim reports from Bukhari, although that's his teacher? So that's a question that needs to be answered, and you have to think about it. Um, anyone have any ideas? There's no right or wrong answer. It's just this is history. You have to kind of come up with a sound understanding of why things happen and what were the reasons. You know, he didn't say the reasons, and we're just trying to figure it all out. Yeah, so that's that's one part of it. That's a big part of it, that Imam Muslim and Bukhari were contemporaries. They were studying with the same teachers. Imam Bukhari's teachers were much higher, but because they're from the same generation, there's less of like an incentive to to relate from each other, right? Because you have the same teachers. Imam Muslim was relating from most of the same teachers. Although he was junior to him, he missed out on many of the senior teachers. But that's one reason. That's that's good. So that that could be one big reason. Anything else? Yeah, same hadith that were what? Thabit, yeah. So I mean, so so they had the same hadith basically. So that's 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 a big part of it. And Imam Muslim didn't want to repeat just to avoid repetition. It's the same hadith. He'll have the hadith from different isnads and different teachers. Or you to go to Bukhari, just adding another level and you're repeating his nads. So that's probably one big part of it as well. Um, you know, and then there's something else someone mentioned online, um, reading one of our, um, so one possibility could be that uh, towards the end of Bukhari's life, you know, there was a controversy that he was involved with, with Dohli, and it became really like, you know, it, it kind of got quite intense. So when it got quite intense, you know, what happens is uh, Bukhari was exiled from the land and he actually died in that exile. Um, I, I don't want to talk about that right now entirely, but um, so perhaps one reason was Imam, Imam Muslim wanted to produce a book that was nobody could hold anything against. When you have a controversy between two individuals, you sometimes you want to avoid names that are controversial, right? So if certain names like in our times are radioactive, right? And you have a name that's radioactive or a scholar that's radioactive. Like some people love him and some people hate him. It doesn't do you good to mention that scholar in your books all the time because then people who hate him will never read your book. People who love him might read your book, but they're blinded by the love. So perhaps that's one reason. Uh, Allahu A'lam. At the end of the day, what we can say is that Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari were cut from the same cloth, they shared the same vision, and Imam Muslim was junior to Bukhari and is certainly a student, and he held him in high esteem for sure. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Any questions? Mm -hmm. yeah so that that's basically what the controversy was uh it was his views on the creativeness of the quran or supposedly his views on the creativeness of the quran so you know a rumor spread that bukhari believed that the quran was created which was a belief of who yesterday we mentioned yesterday who's with jahmi ibn safwan so it's a jahmi view uh, so bukhari like some of his statements were misconstrued 
um, and it seemed like he had that view and then it just spread and then Imam Dohri was a great scholar he started telling people avoid this guy so he started telling people don't sit with this and people started leaving his circles you know Muslim actually is the only one that stayed with him when he was visiting that region um, and then things got quite intense between them so yeah that was the heart of the matter I mean, it was a misunderstanding but um, you know, often most of these controversies are often misunderstandings. A lot of issues are real, but a lot of times they're misunderstandings, exaggerations. Opponents always see, like, they're, you know, people who hate someone, they always see their statements in the worst light. They can never see any good. But when you have someone you like who says the same statements, then you have charitable interpretations of your own people. That happens with all Muslim groups today. Every single group, I can name them. Not one group, all the groups on all sides. When their own scholars say certain crazy things, they make excuse after excuse, and they interpret their words in a charitable light. You know, this is what it really means. But the people on the other side that they hate, they blast, that's the object of their barrels and their targets. Every word is exaggerated. Oh, man, look at what this guy said. And they will never see it in a positive light or a charitable light. That's human nature. That was happening in Imam Bukhari's time as well. So, um, Allah Do you see me mention any names? <laughs> Thank God online people don't hear you. The microphone is off. Okay. Quick topic to cover uh, about the Sahih itself. Um, Oh, I didn't forward the slides. There's nothing on here anyway. Okay. So, I forgot to put the animation on. Now you have the whole conclusion. So no one's going to listen to me. So I'll wait until everyone writes, writes it down. So there's an issue... Um, which is, why does Bukhari repeat hadith so much? So one hadith will be in the Sahih seven times, eight times, twelve times. So you won't find that in Sahih Muslim. So Imam Bukhari often repeats hadith again and again with different isnads, and sometimes they're longer and shorter. So he's condensing them, he's expanding them, he's quoting parts, so he has this fluid use of hadith reports. So that's something we need to tease out a little bit and kind of understand um, in order to understand his, his vision and what he's doing with the Sahih. And it's brilliant. It's something that really adds to this value of the Sahih. So and people, when they don't understand that, like, so Imam Muslim, for instance, um, so hang on. Yeah, so the animation is working backwards. This is the verse, the line I wanted to share. That I, I only remember the second half of everything now, my age. So this is the Shajara Qawmun fil Bukhari wa Muslim ladayya wa qalu ayyu dhaynin taqaddamu. So people, so this is a line of poetry that describes the difference between Bukhari and Muslim. It says people argue or they debate about Bukhari and Muslim in my presence. And say which one is better. فَقُلْتُ لَقَدْ فَاقَ الْبُخَارِيُّ صِحَّةً كَمَا فَاقَ فِي حُسْنِ الصَّنَاعَةِ مُسْلِمُ So he said, I say to them that Bukhari excelled over Muslim in its authenticity. صِحَّةً But Muslim excelled in حُسْنِ الصَّنَاعَةِ In craftsmanship. So as a perfect book of hadith, the consummate book of hadith written on the pattern of Ahl al-Hadith, that's Sahih Muslim. Because it's a jami'ah, there's seven major topics, they're in perfect order. And in every topic, he'll bring the hadith in that strongest hadith first, and then the lesser strong hadith after that. So in every topic, every chapter, you want to know what the strongest hadith is, you go to Sahih Musa, open that chapter, read hadith number one. That's the, the, the asl in that bab. So that's how muhaddithin work. So every hadith is classified in terms of authenticity. And then 
topically arranged in this comprehensive work. Imam Bukhari did something different. So that's perfect craftsmanship, husna sonarati, that's Sahih Muslim. Bukhari, as I mentioned in the first class, what were the two things he was giving you? Two words. Structure and purpose? No. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's from the hadith, but what was he trying to teach you overall? Uh-huh. Can't hear him. Sorry. Sunnah, yeah, he's trying to teach a sunnah, but he's doing it through two things simultaneously. No, okay, you're getting into details, much more basic. So, like Muslim is a book of hadith. Bukhari is? No, Muslim is Jamia too. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Hadith and what's the other thing? Fiqh. So just simply, if you want to summarize, it's hadith and fiqh. So Bukhari is teaching you fiqh as much as he's teaching you hadith. So he has this double goal in mind. That's the whole point. So because of that goal, he's trying to teach you the sunnah, as his sister said. The sunnah is fiqh, understanding how to apply hadith. So he's not just interested in giving you the strongest hadith on every topic. He's trying to teach you how to apply those hadith to various avenues of life. So because of that, he didn't construct a book like Ahl al-Hadith on the pattern of Ahl al-Hadith. It's not a perfectly constructed book in that sense. He's putting hadith all over the book, repeating them. And he has much more expanded chapter heading, not just like Muslim, Kitabul Iman. Yes, Bukhari has Kitabul Iman, but his Abu Wab, he's doing some amazing things, drawing these points and teaching you from one hadith, he'll draw like, you know, a dozen lessons. Most Muslims not doing that. He's just giving you the primary hadith and leaving you to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you you don't mind holding that, just whenever someone speaks, give it to them. Jazakallah. Um, yeah, so absolutely. So, and so that's what makes Bukhari's work so brilliant. He understands that hadith is not just text. Hadith represent the teachings of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as the brother mentioned. Um, you know, Jawami al Kalam means the Prophet's words were so concise but so comprehensive. When I mean, they're like jewels, they're gems. From his hadith, you know, Miskeen is the one who takes a hadith and just learns one thing. But from his words, you can, you know, there are oceans of knowledge that open up from the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bukhari recognized that. Because of that, he repeated hadith again and again throughout his book in various ways. So he was bringing them in multiple sections, sometimes unrelated sections. Sometimes hadith, most muhadithi will put in a, in a chapter on tahara. Qadi will include in chapter relating to aqidah or tafsir or something else. So he's brilliant. His mind is brilliant. He's thinking in like, you know, ultra, you know, super dimensional ways. He's trying to relate everything to everything. So he brings new isnads of a hadith. Uh, he brings different wordings of a hadith. Sometimes he summarizes a hadith. Sometimes he expands on it because this is the point he's trying to make. So all that reveals his legal mind, his acumen, his insight. Not just someone who memorized and gave you the strongest information, but his is a brilliant mind. When you understand that, then you can learn the sahih and benefit from it. If you don't understand that, then you get caught lost. Okay, why is this hadith here? Why is this hadith not here? Why, you know, I would have put this here. And when he does that, he doesn't, he never repeats the same hadith with the same isnad. That's another brilliant thing. He has so many isnads at his disposal. You know, he memorized 600,000 hadith, right? From those, he collected the ones for the al-jami'ah, the sahih. So he has such a repertoire of hadith and isnads at his disposal, dis disposal um, that whenever he re repeats a hadith, he does it with a new purpose. He'll bring a new isnad, like I've, you know, the first and second hadith. That's why the first hadith begins with Makkan teachers. The first Isnad has Makkans in the beginning. And the second Isnad has Medinans in the beginning. Hadith number one is Makkan teachers. Hadith number two, Medinan teachers. What's the chapter? The beginning of Revelation. So just through the names that he picks, he's teaching you that Revelation began in Mecca, continued in Medina. That is brilliant. Not an ordinary mind. No ordinary mind can do that. That's something amazing. That's 
that's what you'll miss out if you don't understand, like try to get into his mind, try to think. So, you know, this is what he's doing. He's doing that through the hadith, he's doing it through the isnads, um, and he's doing that so he has this fluid use of hadith. So uh, Ibn Hajar, he summarizes in this chart here, what were some of the reasons that he brings hadith in various ways. So sometimes to provide multiple meanings and applications to a single hadith. That you can say is the primary purpose. From one hadith, he wants to derive so many lessons and insights. And then sometimes he summarizes the information of a hadith. So he won't give you the whole hadith, but he'll give you a summary of the hadith. Um, so that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of muhaddithin do that. So, you know, you have a long hadith of Jibreel, for instance, with the three questions. And so when you're teaching that to your students, Sometimes you don't want to relate the whole incident. So you just want to talk about the three questions or what Jibri was wearing or something like that. So often he's quoting just a portion of a hadith. Um, or sometimes he's summarizing information. And sometimes to highlight different isnads. Sometimes to highlight different wording. Because sometimes this narrator brought a different wording of the hadith that gives you slightly different adding to the meaning in a different way. And that fits better in a different chapter. So... That's something to keep in mind. It's very, very important. Um, Imam Bukhari is using hadith in a more fluid way than the classical muhaddithin. Uh, although many of them do that. Zuhri did that and many others did that. And he's doing things um, in order to accomplish his simultaneous goal of teaching you fiqh, not just hadith. That's the summary of the matter. And I think that's all I'll say on this topic. And if there's any questions, then we'll break from all yeah so yeah i mean the wordings are so important in hadith sometimes they have different implications right so the whole discussion yesterday about the prophet's supposed suicidal ideations so that was all from a wording of the hadith a version of the hadith that has a wording that comes from Imam Zuhri and not the Prophet, where he interpreted that the Prophet wanted to throw himself off the mountain. And now people use that and they doubt their faith and Islamophobes have a field day with that. But that wasn't an authentic wording. So sometimes the wordings are not authentic. It's the same hadith, but the wording might come from the narrator. The wording might come from Zuhri or one of the sub narrators because, you know, when you describe an event, that's what this is Hadith 101 now. Like Hadith 101, we spend a lot of time talking about that. What is Hadith but companions recall of various moments in the life of the Prophet So These moments are really complex moments. Like how can you summarize the Battle of Badr? Something as like momentous as the Battle of Badr. Angels were involved where it took place over many days and it changed the course of history. Can you put that in one Hadith? No. So there were 313 people there. Those people, when they talk about the Battle of Badr, they're going to talk about it in different ways, in their different recall. Some of them notice certain things, others notice other things. That's why from the same incident, you have different versions. And it's also the companions later, like 50 years later, they're remembering these things. You know, like when you talk to your grandparents, they tell you what happened, like, you know, very early on. And and sometimes you never heard the story. When you spend time with your elders, sometimes, you know, they tell you something you never heard of before and you live with them your whole life because the memory is coming out in different ways. Sometimes something sparks a memory. So that's exactly what hadith is, sparking memories. Like the famous hadith of Inna Allah yarfa'u bihadha al-kitabi aqwaman wa yada'u bihi akhareen. Like we shared that also, I think we did this in other analysis. Allah raises some people with this book and lowers people with this book. And that's in Sahih Muslim, uh, also in Bukhari. So if you look at the Isnad, what happened? Uh, Omar was traveling, you know, to Asfan, a region far away from Medina. He was a Khalifa. He met his governor who was in Mecca, his governor, his representative from Mecca. He was in that same region. He goes, who'd you leave in Mecca? And he said, I left uh, Ibn Abza. And he said, Ibn Abza, who's that? Never heard of him. So he, said, he asked him, who would you leave in charge of Mecca? Just asking him, because that's his governor. And he said, he was one of my former slaves. And Omar is in shock. And he says, you left 
Mawla min mawalikum, like one of your former slaves in charge of the city of Mecca. I mean, what he was trying to say is, how did you pull that off? And, you know, what did he say? He said, look, إِنَّهُ قَارِئٌ لِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَإِنَّهُ عَالِمٌ بِالْفَرَائِلِ He's the one who knows the Qur'an the best among us, and he has the best knowledge of the fara'id, um, you know, the fiqh and the rulings. And Omar so proud of him, and he said, you know what? I remember your Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْفَعُ بِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ أَقْوَامًا وَيَدَعُ بِهِ آخَرِينَ So this beautiful hadith, how did it come out from this conversation and this sparking of a memory of Umar ibn al-Khattab? So that's what hadith is. So that's what hadith is. It's not just like text that the Prophet dictated. The Prophet wasn't a hadith teacher dictating people, write this statement down, write this. He was interacting with them. He was learning with each other. He was teaching them. They were learning from him. So there's so many different hadith that would come out of one incident. And then different companions will have different ways of telling the story. Like when you tell a story of anything in the world, you'll tell it in different ways, right? Like what happened on 9-11 or big story, what happened between the hijrah from India to Pakistan, what happened in, you know, Africa, what happened in the Bosnian War, all these big events. You know, when people who are there, who are around at that time, when they tell those events, they're going to have different recollections, they're going to tell the story in different ways. Doesn't mean they're all wrong and they all have different information. Just this is a natural thing. And that's what hadith is. And that's what Bukhari recognized. And he wanted, despite that, he stuck to the wordings as exact as he could. And his wordings are exact. There's a misconception that Muslim is more exact in his wordings. And Bukhari is less exact in his, more precise in his wording. But Bukhari is less precise. That's not the case. That just represents misunderstanding what Bukhari was doing. He's very exact in his wordings as well. But he's just trying to accomplish fiqh. So he's giving you parts of hadith and he's repeating them with different isnads. Case can be made that Bukhari is much more precise in his wordings than, than Imam Muslim. Wallahu a'lam. Yes. One of the things they mentioned is that Bukhari, since he was somebody who was traveling constantly and he didn't stay in the place, because of that, the Tawti was not as as in a Sahih Muslim who obviously in the, in the commentary always is that Imam Muslim have the best compilation compared to Bukhari, but the ones who defend him always say that no, it was actually because if somebody was collecting for these throughout his life, was traveling all his life. I don't know if that is an accurate uh, justification. This is one. The other one is um, I've always been in a state of confusion, so obviously I haven't taken the approach that you are talking about in terms of focusing on the uh, the isnad mainly because I'm like, all right, I've got to cover as, as many hadith as possible, so I'm going to mm -hmm. focus on the much and just drop the isnad and, and trust uh, the scholars who just say sahih or you know, hasan mm -hmm. or ba'id. So at least I cover, okay, I have, I have 10 more years to live. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's just a goal that I, I've taken a different approach. So yeah, so on, on the first issue, the first issue is like one of the things people bring up with Bukhari was always traveling and learning throughout his life. So that's probably why, or that's presumed why the hadith in his book are like all over the place. But I, that's, that's certainly not the case. So as we mentioned in his biography, like before he traveled, before he set foot outside of his hometown, he had already memorized all the hadith, all the books of Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, Jarrah, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So, so that's a misunderstanding of what hadith circles were. You weren't attending hadith circles to learn new hadith. Well, some people were, yeah. Some, but most of these hadith experts, they already knew the hadith. They're just going there to get another isnad. And to also discuss hadith, and maybe he has a different version or a different wording of the hadith. So Bukhari, when he was a kid, he's 16 years old, he's correcting his teachers. So Bukhari's correcting his teachers. He's 16 years old, he's correcting his teachers. Um, so someone like that, he's not learning hadith throughout his life. He already knows the hadith. He's just traveling for a different purpose. And he didn't travel throughout his life. He traveled for a portion of his life. Then he spent 16 years writing the Sahih. And then uh, he was compiling it over time. But there, But there is something correct to be said that there was a revision that was happening. So anyone who writes a book, you always revise it. Anyone who's ever authored something, like that revision is constant. 
at some point you just have to close the book and move on. But anyone who's written a book, even Imam Malik with his Muatta, even uh, Imam Bukhari, like they're always thinking of new insights and he's putting new stuff in there. So that's why there's different versions of Sahih, depending on which student got the Sahih from him. There's also something called Bayad. Um, don't want to get too technical, but Bayad are the white spots in Bukhari, like uh, literally. What that represents, there are some chapters in Bukhari that says Bab and has a chapter, but no hadith, and then goes to the next chapter. So just an empty chapter. So, you know, what does that empty chapter represent? Probably Bukhari didn't find a hadith that fit his conditions, and he's still thinking about it and researching. So he, he passed away with some of these white spots still there. But what happened is some of his students who weren't that particular or that careful, um, they put hadith in there. So sometimes hadith could be inserted by a, a student or one or two generations after him. Um, and then, and sometimes you just eliminate that chapter entirely. So the chapter is missing from the sahih because there's no hadith, you'll just get rid of the bab. So some editors or, or people who transcribe the work might have done that. Allahu Yeah, I'm done. No, I didn't? No. Okay. So, is there precedence for that? Precedence, yes, but is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a horrible thing because you're tampering with the book. Like, I'm not a fan of tampering with the book. I just remember when I was in, in college, um, the first Arabic book I, I wanted to buy was Ibn Kathir, right? So I went to Dar-es Salaam in Brooklyn. And I wanted Ibn Kathir, and he gave me something different. I bought it, I came home, I thought it was Ibn Kathir, but it's, it's that summarized, authenticated version of Ibn Kathir. Tafsir, uh, what's it called? Al Munir, something Al Munir. Fi Tafsir Ibn Kathir. So they put Ibn Kathir, Tafsir Ibn Kathir in the title, but it's so fancy. If you read it closely, it's another title on top, and Tafsir Ibn Kathir is highlighted. So you think you're reading Ibn Kathir, but you're reading some scholar's summary and his estimation of what should be in there or shouldn't be in there. So I don't trust anybody. I have a non-trusting nature. I want to read what Ibn Kathir wrote. I want to read what Bukhari wrote. I want to read what the original authors wrote. Anyone comes after them to do something like that, it has to be much more clear that this is what it is, but you'll miss out on these insights. Maybe Bukhari repeated a hadith six times to prove something. And then you think, oh, it's, it's a repetition. I'll just put it once. So you missed out on that piece of information. So, you know, you can do that, but it shouldn't be called Bukhari or shouldn't be sold by Bukhari. Dar es Salaam is notorious for doing that. They, they do that with their books a lot. So, yeah, so if you put Mukhtasar, but, but they won't put Mukhtasar as bold as Sahih Bukhari. So, to give you the impression, so like when I bought Ibn Kathir, they didn't, the guy didn't tell me this is not Ibn Kathir. It's, it's based on Ibn Kathir, but a lot of things are eliminated from it. You know. <laughs> I still have the book on my shelf. I don't use it anymore. But sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll read Ibn Kathir. Then I'll look at that just to see what they eliminated. That kind of gives you an idea. Okay, maybe they thought this was not. I mean, there's a lot of inauthentic narrations of Ibn Kathir. But leave Ibn Kathir as Ibn Kathir and put a footnote. That's much better than just eliminating it and selling it at Ibn Kathir. Um, so hadith number seven next week I'm going to show you what Dar es Salaam did with that hadith so yeah bring your Dar es Salaam version next week so I was I was shocked so that's why I told you not to buy that version I mean they must have fixed it but the one that I have is something crazy okay. all right let's take a break from Maghrib online students 15 minutes it's a one volume yeah Okay, where is reading? Go ahead. Bismillah. Bismillah. Hadrathana Musa ibn Ismail, Kala Hadrathana Abu Awanata, Kala Hadrathana Musa ibn Abi Aishata. Aishata. Kala Hadrathana Sa'id ibn Jibayr, 
عن ابن عباس في قوله تعالى لا تخرج به لسانك لتعجل به قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعالج من التنزيل شدة وكان مما يحرك شفتين فقال ابن عباس فأنا أحركهما لكم كما كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يحركهما وقال سعيد أنا أحركهما كما رأيت ابن عباس يحركهما فحرك شفتيه فأنزل الله تعالى لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه قال جمعه له في صدرك وتقرأه فإذا قرأناه فاتبع قرآنه قال فاستمع له وأنصت ثم إن علينا بيانه ثم إن علينا أن تقرأه أن تقرأه فكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعد ذلك إذا أتاه جبريل استطاع فإذا انطلق جبريل قرأه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فما قرأه Good, Jazakallah khair. So, who's the teacher of Imam Bukhari here? So let's to go through the... Musa ibn Ismail. Okay. So, who was Musa ibn Ismail? So, Musa ibn Ismail is one of the 20 teachers that are the frequent teachers of Bukhari. He died in the year 223 of the Hijri calendar. He was a great hadith expert and prolific scholar of Egypt. Uh, for some reason we're on Hadith 5 and two of the teachers are from Egypt. So that's interesting. He is a teacher of Bukhari as well as one of the teachers of Abu Dawood directly. Everyone else, Imam Muslim narrates from him but through an intermediary. So Imam Muslim has his Hadith, Musa bin Ismail, but through a student of his. He never met him. So Bukhari is very high in that regard. So he was... He was someone who was, who he has, Musa bin Ismail has one hadith from Shu'ba, one hadith from Hamad bin Zayd. Shows you how early he is. Just one hadith, he barely met them, but he has one hadith of, that is very, very high in terms of change. Yahya bin Ma'in said about him, so every narrator, we want to know a little bit about where they are, um, what year they died, and what the hadith critic said about them so to know whether they're reliable or not. Obviously, the fact that Bukhari uses him in the Sahih so much, uh, we can conclude that Bukhari, for sure, uh, consider him ultimately or highly reliable. So Yahya ibn Ma'in said about him, ما جلست إلى شيخ إلّا هابني أو عرف لي ما خلا هذا الأثر أثرم التبو ذكي. His full name was Abu Salama Musa ibn Ismail التبو ذكي. So he's someone uh, who was held in high regard by Yahya ibn Ma'in. Uh, he called him thiqa in ma'moon. Thiqa is the highest praise in terms of trustworthiness. Thiqa is when you have adil and dabt. So he was trustworthy. Uh, Ibn Sa'ad called him thiqa, kathir al-hadith, someone who narrated hadith profusely. Uh, Abu Hatim al-Razi said, كَانَ ثِقَةً لَا أَعْلَمُ أَحَدًا بِالْبَصْرَ مِمَّنْ أَدْرَكْنَاهُ أَحْسَنَ حَدِيثًا مِنْهُ So he settled in Basra, he used to teach in Basra, He's originally from Egypt. Um, and Abu Hatim al-Razi said, I don't know anyone in Basra from the people I met who had better hadith than him. Ibn Hibban said, Kana min al-muttaqeen. Um, he was from those who were very pious. Um, so Musa ibn Ismail is one of the favorite teachers of Bukhari. And Bukhari is narrating from him. From who? Who's above him? Abu Awana. So Abu Awana died in the year 176. Abu Awana. His full name was Al Waddah. Al Waddah ibn Abdullah. He was a scholar of Basra. So so far though he's Egyptian origin, but they were, uh, Bukhari learned from him in Basra. So these are Basran teachers. So Abu Awana was Al Waddah ibn Abdullah of Basra. He was a Mawla of Yazid ibn Ata al Bazaz. So he was a great expert of hadith. Um, what was known about him was that he had excellent notes. He had excellent books. Like his hadith were really immaculate. Um, 
So what did they say about him? So he's one of the people that is said about Imam Ahmad, for instance, I'll read you his direct quote. Um, they asked him about Abu Awana, what do you think about him? He said, إِذَا حَدَّثَ أَبُوْ عَوَانَ مِنْ كِتَابِهِ فَهُوَ أَثْبَتْ وَإِذَا حَدَّثَ مِنْ غَيْرِ كِتَابِهِ رُبَّمَا وَهَمْ So if Abu Awana relates hadith from his books, he is fully reliable. But if he's relating from memory or from other people's books or not from his own books, then he uh, often makes mistakes, sometimes makes mistakes. رُبَّمَا وَهَمْ uh, Affan also said the same thing. كان أبو عوامة صحيح الكتاب كثير العجم والنقط كان ثبتا. He had many many books. He was among those who didn't narrate from memory, but he had notes and books. And they were excellent books with great markings and written very well. كان ثبتا. But what happened is during the last days, um, كان يقرأ من كتب الناس فيقرأ الخطأ. Others said the same thing. Towards the end of his life, often he started teaching hadith from other people's books. He didn't have his own notes, and often he would read the mistakes as well that are written in those books. So this is important. Uh, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, someone of his stature, related hadith from him. Yahya al-Qattan said, Abu Awana min kitabihi ahabu ilayya min shu'ba min hifdihi. He said, for me, Abu Awana relating from his books is better than Shorba relating from his memory. Shorba is someone who's immaculate memory. So that just tells you, um, you know, his status. But in which circumstance was he reliable? Ali ibn al-Madini says, كان أبو عوانا في قتادة ضعيفا لأنه كان قد ذهب كتابه. So he was a student of Qatada and Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. So great early Muslims, Tabirin. So Abu Awana was a student of them, but because when he was studying Qatada, he didn't have his books or he lost his books, um, he's not considered that reliable from Qatada. So if there's an Isnad Abu Awana from Qatada, then it's not that reliable. Is this from Qatada? No. It's okay. So these are little tidbits um, that tell you the, the complexities of the science and how nuanced it was. It's not the case that a person is just reliable or not in all circumstances. They were looking at, Muhaddithin were looking at circumstances. That's very important. That's something we often miss. They were looking at circumstances. It's not just this person could be reliable in certain circumstances, not in others. Certain transmitters were reliable when they were teaching in a certain city. In other cities, they were not. And certain, certain reporters were reliable when they were teaching from their books. When they're not teaching from their books, then they're not. So this is a very sophisticated science. And this is the depth that these scholars are going into to try to determine these things. So Abu Awana, um, he's the teacher of Musa ibn Ismail. Who's above him? Musa ibn Abi Aisha. Musa ibn Abi Aisha. So someone like Shorba, someone like Sufyan al -Thawri, and Sufyan ibn Uriyana narrated hadith from him. So he was a teacher of these three giants. So that you can already conclude that he must have been reliable. Shorba was very specific, very strict about his teachers. Shorba is one of the strictest transmitters and muhaddithin out there. Um, Sufyan ibn Uriyana said about him, Haddathani Musa ibn Abi Aisha wa kana min al He used to be proud of learning from him. He said, Musa ibn Abi Aisha narrated to me, and he was from the reliable people. Um, Yahya ibn Ma'in and ibn Hibban both deemed him to be thiqa, trustworthy. Abu Hatim said, Salih al Hadith. Um, so he was someone whose hadith were good, they were deemed reliable enough to be relied on. Now, we don't know when he passed, we don't know his full name. So there are many transmitters when you go earlier in the generations, often you don't know a whole lot about them. So now you're getting very close. You're getting close to the era of the Sahaba and the Tabarin. Um, so we don't know the date of his death. We don't know his father's name. All we know is Musa ibn Abi Aisha and these great early giants, they relied upon him and held him to be trustworthy. Musa ibn Abi Aisha relates from who? Sa'id ibn Jubair. And Sa'id ibn Jubair relates from Ibn Abbas. 
radiallahu anhuma. So Sa'id ibn Jubair is one of the greatest of the Tabi'in. So he's he died in 95 of the Hijri calendar. Um, so he's someone you can speak a lot about. Um, this is not a biography class, but just briefly, he was of African origin, and he was known as the greatest among the greatest of the Tabi'in. If there were top five, he would be there. Um, he was known for his tremendous piety, his great worship his legendary courage, his knowledge, prolific knowledge. He was considered to be the best student of Ibn Abbas, even better than Mujahid and Akrimah, two of his other students. So he's relating this hadith from Ibn Abbas. So he was one of his best students. So he was someone who was courageous. He was killed by who? Anyone remember his story? Hajjaj, yeah. Hajjaj bin Yusuf, uh, so he was, he was courageous. Hajjaj bin Yusuf was on his bloody rampage, um, destroying cities in the Muslim world and um, killing so many companions. Um, you know, and there were so many scholars that were bore the brunt of his anger. And one of them was Sa'id ibn Jubair. So he left Kufa, he was from Kufa, um, to escape all that turmoil, and he went to settle in Mecca. And there he used to teach in Mecca and he used to teach and, and he used to visit Mecca a lot prior to that, learn from Ibn Abbas and others. So he's the one like, you know, his stories are incredible. Like he's one of the last people Hajjaj killed because he's so, when Hajjaj has been, he was chasing him for quite some time and eventually caught up with him. And then, you know, they took him from his house and he had no fear. And Hajjaj had a long exchange with him and, you know, he asked him, you know, do you want me to pardon you? And he was like, no, only Allah can pardon me. I mean, you have nothing in your hands. And Hajjaj was trying to test him to see if he would budge, to see if he would beg for mercy. That's what tyrants do. They want you to beg for mercy so they can give you, you know, like pardon or whatever. And he refused to do that. And he was so um, adamant. And, um, and then he asked him, okay, I'm going to kill you. And he said, how do you want to die? How do you want me to kill you? He said, you know, just think about it. Whatever you want to kill me, that's what Allah is going to do to you on the day of judgment. You're going to go through whatever you do to me, so think about it carefully. It doesn't matter to me, but think about yourself. So he was, you know, he had this legendary exchange, and he made dua when finally he was about to die. He said, oh Allah, enough is enough. Let me be the final person that Hajjaj kills. You know, he's been oppressing people enough, and... Lo and behold, that's what happened. After him, Hajjaj didn't live long. And there are reports, people saw Hajjaj in dreams and he was being tormented, all because of Sa'id ibn Jubayr. So he's, you know, his piety, his dua, his courage, so probably be contributed to the end of the bloody reign of Hajjaj bin Yusuf. So he was executed and beheaded in year 95 of the Hijri calendar by Hajjaj. So, from a hadith transmitter perspective, he's very reliable from as a student of Ibn Abbas. So he relates his hadith from Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas, what is he doing? He's giving you tafsir in this hadith. This hadith is basically tafsir. So this hadith is basically tafsir. So he's going through a verse of the Quran, La tuharik bihi lisanak li In his tafsir, there are some details about early revelation. And that's why Bukhari chooses to include that here. This is not Kitab al-Tafsir, but this is, the chapter is about the beginning of Revelation. So it's a, it's a great hadith. Um, you have it on the board here. Um, if we go through it, the text of the hadith now. Um, so the first thing that uh, Ibn Abbas says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُعَالِجُ مِنَ التَّنْزِيلِ شِدَّةً So, uh, what is the translation some of you have? I'm just curious. You want to have the English from it? Yeah. Yeah, number five. Okay, good. What kind of mimma you had to So, your Ali Jumina Tanzili Shiddatan means it shows you how intense revelation was. So, like the beginning, the first hadith or the second hadith rather, 
we kind of saw that as well. You, you mentioned that that revelation was very intense and very difficult. It wasn't something easy. So like the English expression, as easy as revelation, or it comes to me like revelation is a misnomer. Reality is revelation, something very intense on the physical body and mentally intense. It's a difficult experience. And we mentioned perhaps the wisdom is that nothing worth its salt comes without effort. And even something like revelation where there really is an effort from you, but Allah made the experience intense where you go through some turmoil and the Prophet is sweating profusely, even on a cold night, as that hadith told us. So this Ibn Abbas is sharing the same detail. used to bear the revelation with great intensity, great hardship, great difficulty. It was shadid upon him. وَكَانَ And then he shares an additional detail. He says, وَكَانَ مِمَّا يُحَرِّكُ شَفَتَيْهِ And the Prophet ﷺ used to move his lips when the revelation came. So it was hard enough, the revelation. It was intense enough. But now the Prophet had an additional fear, an additional stress upon it, which is that this revelation is a very heavy responsibility. I have to share this with the Ummah. I have to teach the Ummah. So the revelation is coming down and he's already repeating it moving his lips, trying to memorize it. So, you know, that tells you, it gives you a glimpse into his, um, his, 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 what he was going through, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So out of fear of forgetting, he would start reciting before it finished. That's what Hassan al-Basri says. Tirmidhi in another isnad, in a hadith, he says, يُحَرِّكُ بِهِ لِسَانَهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَحْفَظَهُ He used to move his tongue, meaning he would repeat the words so that he would memorize them quickly so he wouldn't forget them. So what happens? So Allah corrected that. So Allah said no. So Allah revealed some verses after that. Um, so there's a hadith. Okay, here it is. فَقَالَ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسِ فَأَنَا for Before that, Ibn Abbas used to, when he teach, he used to say, فَأَنَا أُحَرِّكُهُمَا لَكُمْ كَمَا كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ يُحَرِّكُهُمَا He says, and I am moving my lips in front of you the way the Prophet ﷺ was moving his lips, and he would move his lips. And then, قَالَ سَعِيد Who's Sa'id? So that's in the, in the matan. So when you see قَالَ سَعِيد, you might forget, okay, where's Sa'id? Go back to the Isnad chart. Sa'id is the student of Ibn Abbas. Sa'id used to say the same thing. أَنَا أُحَرِّكُهُمَا Sa'id used to tell his students the same thing. I am moving my lips the way uh, Ibn Abbas used to move his lips. So anyway, that's just an interjection. So here in this Darut Ta'seel edition, you have dash. That's to show you now this is an interjection. Qala Ibn Abbas until the end. So now Ibn Abbas is continuing. Ta'ala. So then Allah revealed a verse or series of verses to correct the Prophet وسلم, and he said Surah Al-Qiyamah لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعْهُ وَقُرْآنَ and then the verse continues فَإِذَا قُرْآنَهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ um, so what is this verse saying? so let's look at the verses first so Allah says لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به. Do not move your tongue in haste. إن علينا جمعه وقرآن. For behold, it is upon us to gather it in your heart and to cause it to be read. فإذا قرأناه and when we recite to you, يعني جبريل, فاتبع قرآن. Follow the recitation. اتباع. ثم إن علينا بيانا. And then it will be upon us to make it clear to you, the meaning clear. So what is this ver these verses teaching us? So this whole hadith is a commentary on these verses from Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is the Mufassir of the Quran. He's the one the Prophet made dua for. So often Ibn Abbas, when you see a hadith of Ibn Abbas, it would often have to do with tafsir, what the Quran means. So here, so this is a beautiful uh, instruction from Allah Azza wa Jal to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look, don't worry about repeating the words. Right now, you just need to listen. Um, so, you know, when the Qur'an is recited, what is supposed to be done? In, the, in other verses, the Qur'an tells you, ansitula, be silent, fastamiru, and to listen. 
So that's the demeanor of the believer. You have to be silent and you have to listen. So ansitu means not to speak, uh, to be silent. And istama'a comes from sama'a. Sam sama'a means to hear. Istama'a means to actively hear. So, because you can hear things, right? Like often you hear things, but you're not really listening. That often happens between husband and wife. Um, so, istama means you're actually listening, right? So there's there's three things here, right? So there's uh, being quiet, because sometimes you can hear somebody while you're talking too. You're not necessarily quiet. So the Quran, what does the Quran demand? When you listen to the Quran, the heiba, the the Quran demands that when the Quran is revealed or is recited, you need to be silent, you need to be hearing the Quran, and you need to be listening to it attentively and actively. So this was a correction of the Prophet. So, so it does not behoove the believer when the Quran is frighted to be repeating something, but to be distracted. And there are many verses of the Quran that have the same idea that, you know, when the Quran is revealed, listen to it. Uh, it's, um, I don't recall the verse. It's Tamirullah. What's the verse? When? It's, yeah, what's it's Tamirullah who wants it to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so all these elements are there. And then the surah of the jinn. The jinn, when they were listening to the Quran, the same thing. So the Quran needs a person to be listening attentively and without any distraction. And that's the secret behind why Allah says, An-Nabi al-Ummi. The Quran was revealed on al-Ummi. Nabi, that is Ummi. Ummi doesn't just mean unlettered. It doesn't just mean someone's illiterate. It means someone who's empty, had no preconceived. That's what Shaykh Akram's take is. And nabi al-Ummi, the beauty and the wisdom behind that is the Quran comes to the hearts that are open to it. If your heart is already filled with other things, you're not going to benefit from the Quran. So even if the Nabi, our Nabi, had a huge pre-existing civilization he was part of, suppose he was part of the Egyptian pharaonic civilization with their whole culture and their pyramids and everything, then it would have been a different thing. But he was born into Makkah, a barren valley, Wadin Ghayri Zarain, a valley with no geography, no pre-existing culture, no pre-existing civilization, only a house that Ibrahim built. Nothing else there. Even when you go to Mecca, we love going to Umrah, but there's really nothing in Mecca. When you walk around the streets, right? There's really nothing there. It's just rocks. It's kind of like a parking lot, one big parking lot. So as a ge ge geography, there's really nothing there. And that's the wisdom of why Allah revealed the Quran there in those mountains. And Allah you know, chose the messenger from there and the city of Mecca to be there. It was part of Allah's project. So the Quran is related to that. The Quran needs to be upon, you know, an ear and a heart that is open and not distracted in any way. So when the Prophet was stressed out and he, he was repeating the words, Allah told him, look, don't worry, just listen. And we are the ones who will make you remember it. So, and then um, what does the hadith goes on? It says, فَاسْتَمِعْ So this is Ibn Abbas. He's interjecting his tafsir. So, إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعَهُ وَقُرْآنَا Ibn Abbas says, قَالَ جَمَعُهُ لَهُ فِي صَدْرِكَ وَتَقْرَأَهُ We are the ones who are going to gather it into your heart, so you will recite it. So that's Ibn Abbas's tafsir in between the verses. Then, فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَا Ibn Abbas's tafsir, فَاسْتَمِعُ لَهُ وَأَنصِرْ Listen to it attentively and be silent. And then, ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ And it is upon us to explain it. Um, Ibn Abbas said, ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا أَن تَقْرَأَهُ It is upon us that you will recite it. فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ After this verse was revealed, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم إِذْ أَتَاهُ جِبْرِيل استمع. When Jibreel used to come to him, he would just listen. فَإِذًا طَلَقَ جِبْرِيلُ And when Jibreel left, قَرَأَهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَمَا قَرَأَهُ جِبْرِيل um, So the Prophet would recite just like the Jibreel had recited. So this is a great, great teaching that, um, you know, you see the responsibility of the Nabi, which is to teach the Ummah this revelation. 
And then you also see his attitude, Allah corrected what it should be with the revelation. And then, Thumma inna alayna bayana. So, Thumma inna alayna bayana is very important because it is upon us to explain it to you. Don't worry about the meanings right now. We will explain it to you. So, what does that mean? There's a deeper meaning here is, Thumma inna alayna bayana. That means Allah will explain the meanings to the Prophet Wasallam. So he wasn't just receiving Quran, he must have been receiving other things through Jibreel. And it must have been the case when Jibreel was reciting, sometimes the Prophet would ask, okay, what does this word mean? And Jibreel must have gave him the meanings. It is upon us to explain it. So Bayan al-Quran is a very important concept. It's a concept that tells you that what does it mean for us? For us, it means that since the Prophet ﷺ was explained the Quran, <coughs> his explanation for us is the most authoritative one. So for us to understand Quran, we need to go back to, you know, the teacher of Quran, the first teacher, and that is the Prophet ﷺ. And so many silly people today, they rejectors of Sunnah and Hadith, and they just want Quran. So they treat the Prophet like, you know, like a mailman, you know. He just gave us a book, and now it's for us to read it. Like, like how can he divorce the messenger from the book? Because the book comes with the messenger. Um, even the Quran itself, verse after verse, speaks about it. We reveal this to you, O Messenger of Allah, so that you may explain to the people what is being revealed to them. That's the Quran speaking, it's not a hadith. So that means the Prophet's explanations which he received from Allah through Jibreel um, must be authoritative for us. So, and that is what this Sahih al-Bukhari is a perfect blend of Quran and the Sunnah. He always brings with verses of Quran in the beginning of the chapters to tie it back to a Quranic paradigm. And then he's sharing with you the Prophet's explanations and the Prophet's living the Quran because the whole life of the Prophet beginning to end is Quran. As he was a living, walking Quran, as Aisha radiallahu anha described him. So it's very important to have this sense in mind that, you know, it's not that you have Quran, you have Hadith, it's separate. It's all one organic whole. You know, Allah revealed the book upon a messenger, and Allah spoke to that messenger more than beyond the verses of this book. And that messenger taught the companions, but the base was always this book. So the Quran itself is under-recognized as a bayan of the Quran. So when it says, Summa inna alayna bayana, some people make tafsir that this means a sunnah. It's not just a sunnah because what is bayan of the Quran? The Quran itself explains the Quran. Right? So the Quran is the best explanation of the Quran. Shah Wadiullah speaks about that. Um, and most of the great Mufassirin, they say the same thing. Now, when you don't understand something in the Quran, and Ibn Taymiyyah also speaks about that, you just have to be patient and read the rest of the Quran. You'll find the answer somewhere in the Quran. So the Quran itself explains other parts, portions of the Quran. Allah did that because Allah says, "Inna alayna bayana." You know, upon us is the explanation. But not only Quran, but Allah also communicated with the Prophet through Wahi that's other than Quran. So it's one organic whole. So you know, we need to start looking at things in in this holistic, organic fashion rather than this fragmented fashion. Oh, well, that's Quran, that's Hadith, that's Fiqh, that's this, that's that. Everything is combined together. And that's what the beauty of Sahih al-Bukhari, it's one organic whole. It's not just a book of Hadith, it's also a book of Fiqh. Not just a book of Fiqh, it's also a book of Tafsir. Not just a book of Tafsir, it's just an organic whole. Um, you know, it presents Quran, it presents Hadith, it presents early opinions as well. and puts them all together for you in an organic way. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. That's my class for today. We're ending early. We're done with hadith number five. The floor is now open. <laughs> we have seven hadith. So next week is the final uh, week. Two more classes to go. And the seminar is over. So next week, two more classes. You have hadith six to cover, hadith seven to cover, and, and a whole bunch of topics relating to the Sahih, inshallah. And the journey is ongoing, inshallah. In the fall, we'll go to Kitab al-Iman, book two, and inshallah continue. But any questions on today's material? Just or comments, even comments. On the, on the
Hebrews. So that's like a mafum al mukhalifa, I guess, because the verse is saying don't recite it, don't move your lips, but the implication of that is when you're reciting Quran yourself and Jibli's not reading it to you, then you move your lips. So um, so that means you, when you recite Quran, you don't just look at the word silently, you have to move your lips. That's itara. But when someone else is reciting, you're listening, then you don't move the lips and you just listen. Based upon this is a well-known fiqh dispute about like in Salah, do you recite Fatiha behind the Imam or not? So many great ulama said no, because all these verses of the Quran tell you when Quran is being recited, uh, you have to be silent. You don't move your lips. So if you put this together with that, then that seems to be more correct. <laughs> Allahu alam. Don't know. No, he is. So, uh, but I'm not the fuffy. I haven't. I don't remember what he said about that. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll get there. Kitab al Salah is like about five books now. Is this one of the hadiths where the teacher repeated? Oh, good question. So, uh, it's not, and that's interesting why. So, so there's, in Hadith 102, we, we talked about Musal Salat, right? Who remembers the line of Baikuni? <laughs> oh, okay. Musal Salun, right? Uh, so anyway, the, so Musal Salat is a Hadith that narrated with an action or a story. So it could be like a hadith narrated in a particular way or through a certain action. So here it looks like the hadith is kind of trying to be musalsal, right? Because Ibn Abbas would move his lips to his students and then Sa'id moved his lips to his students. But after Sa'id, no one did it. If someone continued doing that after that, then it would be one of the musalsal hadith today that we would be all learning from and getting ijazah in from teachers. And we would all move them and then we would move, you know, but somehow it only happened for two generations and it died out. And the reason Shaykh Akram speaks about that, he said, you know, it would be one of the strongest Musad Salat we have. But he said the reason is because that's entertainment. That's not real knowledge. That's just like extra stuff. So early Muslims weren't into that. They didn't care about these things. Later Muslims really care about these things. Uh, so it's not that essential to the message. And that's why Saeed ibn Jubayr and his students didn't continue it on. That's why we don't have a whole lot of these. There's only a handful. Musal Salat Hadith, like, you know, there's total, like, just uh, about a dozen or so, and most of them are not authentic anyway. There's only two or three authentic ones. So, Allah, I don't know. Yeah. Isn't also like a built in fear that you don't want to improperly mimic what is that? Maybe, I, I guess. I mean, there could be a fear. Allah, I don't know. But then why doesn't it apply to the other ones? Um, Qabd al Lahya, that still continues to be transmitted. Um, the fingers, um, Aswadain who are drinking water and dates, and so many others. There's a handful of Musa Salat. You mentioned that Abu Arana wasn't reliable. He wasn't reliable? Oh, when he's not from his books. Yeah. yeah. From his books. I was mm -hmm. curious about what other circumstances where the Hakim Abu Arana was always with Marjorie. And when you mentioned one of those was there. Lost the books from Abu Hatada. Okay. But then, like, oh, good, good question. So, why would a scholar not have his books in front of you? So, let me tell you, like, so let me tell you my personal thing today. You see my books? They're not here today. Why aren't they here today? Because a couple of reasons. Like, I got so tired of carrying them. They're so big and I have so much to carry. And then today I didn't have my car, and so I needed a ride. My son took the car, and he was supposed to be back at 7. He wasn't. So I was a little off my game. So I was like, you know, forget these books. So let me just wing it today. So I came to class today without having the books to look up. I have my notes. 
So there are many circumstances in life where that would happen, right? Um, either you lose the books or a lot of these scholars are traveling. Suppose a scholar is traveling to Mecca for Hajj and people want to learn Hadith from him. Now he's not carrying his books with him. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So there could be many scenarios where you're forced to teach, but you don't have your books. So, but when you're in your own hometown, in your house and you're teaching Hadith or in your own hometown or your masjid, then it's imagine that you probably would have your books. But there's so many cases, so that's why they say when this scholar is from his, in his own town, then he's authentic. But when he's narrating the same Hadith in Syria, when on his travels, then he's not that authentic. So that's the reason why. Arshad. You can bring it down, I think. So um, I know this is my point of sort of the very apparent news that book. Um, so I know we spoke about uh, you know Tafsir of Quran, the Quran, and Tafsir of Quran, the mm -hmm. uh, So I we spoke about you know Ibn Kathir also. So I know you mentioned you know generally reading the original is better, but for a layman, wouldn't the Muhtasar be a safer approach because at least you're going at least let's say. You know, in our time, um, there's one which I recommend in Tahir, but he's going to be a different scholar. So at least someone has done the tahqib, and you're at least focusing on the things you choose, or at least can you know, go back and say, okay, I can trust the scholar. And it's, you know, tafsir al And it's like, uh, I used this in one of the masajids, mm -hmm. and I just gave a small tafsir on some of these ayahs. I was like, I know this, these ayahs have, if it's going back to narration of the Prophet. So wouldn't that approach be a safe approach with all the things that yeah so yes yeah, it's a good question so there is a role for muhtasarat i just personally don't like them and but muhtasar like a summarized version of something is very valuable for its own reasons because most people can't read like the original works or they don't have time so why not take a selection but it's just like i have a i have trouble trusting people that's my problem so like the person who did the muhtasara, how could it be safer? I, I don't, I think, uh, I just think about the mistakes that person would make. Like, you know, like, so, because like, you know, this is subjective. Some people might, okay, this is not a had strong hadith. Um, let me take this out. And do you trust that person's judgment who's doing the muhtasar? Um And also, um, often the muhtasara they lead to problems. Like you believe you're reading something like, so like, um, the hadith about the suicide, right? It's not in the English version. It's a translation that Ramjan has from Dar es Salaam. They took it out. Is it English or just Arabic? Both. Okay. Is it summarized? Is it summarized, right? Yeah. So they took it out. But I mean, that's summarized, so you can't really make. It's in there. It's in Sunnah.com. No, we it was there, like it was yesterday. Not the word, but like, who cares if the word is not there? Prophet is standing at the edge of the mountain to throw himself off. Jibril says, come and stop. Then he comes again to the mountain to throw himself off. That's there. But they, like, does it matter if you're saying that or like the meaning is, uh, you know, suicide or killing yourself? So, so the problem with that is like people, so suppose like, you know, you, you read that version and you never read that. And then some Islamophobe comes to you, you know, your, your prophet went through this, and you're like, no. You're like, yeah, it's in Bukhari. And then you look up Bukhari, it's not there. And then someone shows you there's a different version of Bukhari, it has it there. And then it'll shake your faith. You're like, oh, wait, there's different versions. So, like, you know, you need to leave the books the way they are and then just cross reference them and footnote them. But summarize is different. Muhtasar is like a Muhtasar, but. I don't know, I just never found anyone who I trust as to do a muhtasar. Like, I still want the original. Like, what topics would you eliminate from Bukhari? I want everything Bukhari is teaching us. Like, which, which things are extra? Like, muhtasar means there are a lot of extra things that maybe you don't need. I don't believe anything in, in Bukhari is extra. Not a single hadith is extra. So you'll miss out on that. But you're right, if you have a class, you have a seven-week class or a month class, you're going to take a selection. We all do that. You're right. Yeah, yeah, as an introduction, as a taste, is good. Yeah, awesome. You got to mention names. 
Yeah. Take the mic away from him. They say Bukhari is of like a highest caliber of books, uh -huh. and um, you know it's with, with any subject the highest caliber is only for the master of of that topic. So the layman should not be reading Bukhari because you know it can confuse them. And... There's there's an argument that can be made for that. So that's why I'm trying to get you up to the like beyond the layman category so you can start benefiting from the book of course it's a complex book not everyone can benefit but at the same time there's still there's still a great benefit in reading sorry bukhari beginning to end and there's so much loss for not doing that you know the, the sisters there are sisters that reading bukhari beginning to end in like rahma and then dr farad hashmi's program in our community they're all around us like it's crazy they are read, they are people that finished the entire Sahih Bukhari beginning to end. They're not going to this level of detail, but that is amazing that the Muslim sisters or older, they care of children, they've gone through all of Bukhari beginning to end, even a cursory way. Imagine not missing that. Just in the that same argument you can extend to the Quran. There are people say about the Quran too. You can't understand the Quran. That's not for laymen. You can just read it for barakah, but so people say that as well. So you'll miss out on a lot doing that. I mean, we know where they're coming from. We understand and we agree. It's a complex book, sophisticated book. Not everyone can understand. Even great scholars didn't understand like some points. So that's why the solution is not to not read it. The solution is, 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 is to learn how to read it. Bring yourself up to that level so we can benefit from it. That's why I'm doing this seminar. And I was going to interject. I would suggest that we do that as well. That we actually do a complete reading of Bukhari. You know, yeah. Uh, in, a, in another session, in another time, in another place, etc., so that we can get the benefit of seeing how all of these hadith are used in other places, right? And how they fit in, basically, from what you're, what you have already, you know, kind of expressing your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's different types of read. There's a cursory reading, a broader reading, then there's detailed reading. You have to do that with the Quran too. That's why in the wisdom of Ramadan, you, have, you try to recite the entire Quran beginning to end. That's very different from looking at every verse and doing tafsir and just thinking about it. That would take you like the whole day with three verses. But finishing the whole Quran in like three days or a week is a different type of reading. There's value to all of them. We need to do all of that. Even with Sahih Bukhari, there's a value to reading the whole book, beginning to end, just going through the meanings really quickly. You pick up so many things. And we've, I mean, I've done a fair amount of sessions where we read the whole thing in these sessions to Muhaddithin. Like every time you read the whole book, there are things that pop out that you never thought about. And then it just stays in your mind. So the more you read, the more these things come together. And the more, and, but you also have to do that micro reading. This is macro reading. You also have to do the micro reading, like what we're doing now. Because then when you combine the two, then it just enhances you to a different level. If you just have macro reading and no micro reading, you'll never get the full benefit. You'll get a lot of benefit. But if you only have micro reading without macro, you miss the bigger picture. So you need both. Is there someone that actually does that vocally? I mean, in terms of that actually reads the entire Bukhari without any explanation whatsoever or anything? You know, because it does take in a great Arabic, deal. right? It obviously, Arabic. it takes a great deal of time and energy to do that. Um, well, what's stopping you from doing it at home? That's what, in like in a group setting, the reason they would do that is to get ijazah, right? So you read the whole Sahih Bukhari with teacher, and then you can get an ijazah that says, "I read the entire Sahih Bukhari," or "I heard the entire Sahih Bukhari from this teacher." Just to get that, it's not. It's a symbolic value. It's nothing more than that. Baraka, yes, yeah, symbolic and baraka. But a lot of people who read it, like they don't understand the Arabic, they're just reading it. Like, so, so, but so for our context, it would be reading it with translations and that, that already is kind of explaining it. So, and it would take a lot longer reading it, read the translation, reading it, read the translation. How do you combine the two? If you have a question about a word that's in the text, just stop and say, okay, or, to, or even later on in another kind of setting, be able to ask the teacher. I don't. Know, I didn't. I, I. I was following you in your reading. I didn't understand this word. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to me? 
But it, I was just going to say, it just takes, I've sat in a class like that before, and, and you can get a tip. So, tip, it's an immediate session. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, so it takes like starting the Bukhari that kind of macro session. So uh, it takes about ten days or like two weeks or so. So they they do them. They're pretty popular in the Middle East and in other parts of the world. It's not that popular here, but um, that's that's roughly how long it would take. But what what it involves is the well, they pick a central location, a masjid, and there's a number of senior scholars that are sitting there. And then students are reading to them. And so there's sometimes hundreds of students and sometimes thousands of students reading Sayyid Bukhari. And, you know, you read from morning to night, basically. So the sessions start like Dohar time and at Isha time, for instance, with some breaks for Salah. So what's the purpose and value of that? Uh, for serious students, there's a value like you just bought this new copy of Sahih Bukhari. Now you want to read it in these sessions. So sometimes you pick up mistakes and you put a note here. Or you'll say, okay, I got to cross-reference this. So you see these things. And sometimes these editions have typos. Typos get uncovered. All the time in these sessions, I hear the students reading and teacher says, no, it's not like that. And he said, that's what my book says. He says, khata. Uh, the khata this is a typo. Like, so this is the value of these things. You learn how to read your books. You uncover some mistakes. And you get the baraka, like the, the ijazah in that book, uh, going back to the author. Allah Alam. <laughs> yes. What I was doing when I used to attend them, I used to have like my Bluetooth on in one ear while I'm seeing patients and just hearing these books. <laughs> I've done that years ago <laughs> when I was in that phase of my life. <laughs> <laughs> once once uh we were doing an intense session i think it was bukhari or muslim I forgot and and our time was juma so i kept it on during the juma <laughs> so i was listening to the khutbah and listening to the hadith but um alhamdulillah i mean these once you understand Sayyid bukhari once we learn it and after we do a couple of kitabs then there could be a value for something like that here, inshallah. We'll see. We could do like a retreat, Bukhari retreat. And they're already doing that. They have that all the time, Bukhari retreats in Turkey. All the time. Yeah, all over the world. We're talking about New Jersey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does. He does that. that. Sheikh Walid Idris does that in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. He's done a fair amount of sessions. But that's not what we're about. We're trying to understand exactly. comprehension. That's more important. Exactly. That's more important. Yes. Getting more into the controversy uh, with the body, right? Like the whole idea of rejecting school and what they were trying to bring about when it said the creation plan. I don't never understood what exactly was the purpose of it. Uh, this is being called Kalam Allah versus like it's created. Like what was the purpose and why did they bring Bukhari into it? Well, I mean, so um, I'm going to talk about that next week, like, um, but the purpose is uh well it's a philosophical debate right like it's hard to understand like the quran is the word of allah and then what about like if i don't have the quran in front of me but what about this this is the word of allah this is paper this is like ink this is a creation so which part of that is creation which part of uh, that is divine and if it's the words of allah what about when i'm reciting when i recite La tuharrik bihi lisanaka li bi. those are my words my voice box my sound which part of that is divine which part of that is creation so you can see that there's a complexity there not to dismiss like the other side one or the other side you know the our orthodox scholar they they, they came up with the view that the quran is kalamullah and not created and they were stick, strict on that based on imam ahmad but can you appreciate the ones who said the quran was created like it doesn't it's not that nonsensical right it's just because like they'll say, well, what about the word? What about 
that's divine speech coming from your mouth. So Bukhari says something like that, the words that I'm reciting to you are created, but this Quran is the speech of Allah. So it was misinterpreted. It was misunderstood and someone accused them of saying the Quran is created. Because a portion is created, right? The, the verse, the pages are created, the book is created, Musaf is created, the ink is created, our voice is created because we're a creation. So that's like, where, where does that creation end and where does the divine part begin? That's, you know, that's where the debate boils down to. And also the implications are, so different issue implications are, if you believe it's created, then you don't give it that sanctity that the sanctity is diminished somewhat. Quran is just a creation, okay, and it might not apply to us. And most modern religions and many modern Muslims are following down that path, like they believe, you know, their scripture is just human. Even the Christians, when you really push them, they'll say, well, yeah, it's human, but it was divinely inspired in an indirect way. And there are Muslims that are saying that about the Quran. It's not the direct speech of Allah. It's divinely inspired, but it's human speech, and there are parts that might be wrong, parts that might not make sense to us today. So those are the implications, and this is the reason why they had the debate. Sifat of what? Yeah, I mean, so it's the same philosophical issue, like to say Allah speaks, it kind of like, you can see like how that's problematic, could be problematic, oh, does he speak like us, is he like a, you know, a big being that has like voice and that means he has a voice box, that means he has teeth and a tongue, so because of, because of these reasons, that's what led many of these early Muslims or many of these sects to deny attributes of Allah. So, you know, you have to understand where everyone's coming from, but then you have to come to the truth too. So I, you know, I understand like, you know, and it's even among Ahlul Sunnah, like mainstream, there's big debates about, you know, the love of Allah. And the, is that, you know, metaphoric or not? Or Allah's throne, Allah descending in the night, is it literal, is it metaphoric? Is it because they have a problem? If it's truthful and literal, then does that mean Allah occupies body and space? So these are all philosophical details that led to all these debates. They will never go away. They're part of every group. They're part of like some of these sects came out of the mainstream and they're not considered mainstream by anyone, but some of them kind of stayed within the broad Sunni umbrella and they still had major differences. So I'm hoping to bring I kind of got a preliminary okay. I want Sheikh Hatim to teach us Aqidah. So he kind of said yes. So um, it's the first time he would be teaching that. I want to see him tomorrow and push him again. And if you see him, push him to teach for the Quran Literacy Institute, not the other places. It's going to be next semester. I mean, next year, either spring or fall, like the September through December or January through May. So I think he can really help us navigate these and try to understand them in a deeper way. Miftah? Mishka, you mean? You don't have the name right. It's Mishka instead. <laughs> okay. 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 I have, um, I mean, anybody who's done research on the scholars, like let's say the spectrum of uh, Sunni scholars, even if it has a, uh, since we're talking about Bukhari, I mean, I had to do a research on you know, the you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, But even then, if you read about them, I, let's say we have to put them in a box, and you know what box, mm -hmm. and they fall under it. But even I, I found his, his opinions a little bit of a spectrum rather than yeah you know so i mean even if there is there's usually an overlap even between the schools of yeah. sony schools and some people from the other schools jump into the other but that's generally what you may come across for them for them at that one i can remember you don't really know but or let's say back up the exams between usually there's like an overlap but i think there's some accommodation that we can have uh i don't know usually i won't say exactly a lot of them yeah you know yeah so there's um there's great overlap and it's not everyone doesn't just fit into one neat box with clear lines between boundaries like everyone's kind of saying the same thing but as a serious student of knowledge you need to understand concepts you need to understand the why behind everything 
when you understand that, then you see where people are coming from. And it doesn't mean you don't have an opinion and you don't have like, you know, you don't choose the right opinion or one stance. You have to on many issues. Um, but if you understand the complexities and read people like, you know, Ibn Hajar, when you read Fathul Bari, like, I have no problem with what he says in most places, you know, so he's definitely like, it's questionable what box you could put him in. Like, is he on this side or that side on the attributes? So the same thing with Nawawi. Sometimes he sounds so much like this group. And sometimes he sounds like that group. So, you know, all these things are not as clear cut um, as we make them out to be. Allah A'lam. Any questions on Hadith 5 or any topic from today? I have a question on uh, the usage of the Bible only. Mm -hmm. I was recently reading somewhere that, uh, I, don't, I don't know who was saying it, but that um, that actually doesn't mean the Prophet was unlettered and that there's actually not proof that he was unlettered. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that's like a legitimate perspective. Yeah, so that's Shaykh Akram's view. He finds it highly problematic and disrespectful to the persona of the Prophet to call him illiterate. And the fact that he was having letters dictated and he had a, such a deep knowledge of things probably shows he, he probably had some rudimentary knowledge. It's, it's hard to prove that he had no knowledge of reading and writing. So that's what the word, one of the meanings of the word, but like she's a Shaykh Akram's take and it comes from Mona Farahi is that an ummi means like someone like with an empty heart. Empty in the sense that ready to receive revelation, no preconceived ideas and notions. And all of us need to be ummi when we come to the Quran. So that's one meaning of that, because ummi is one of those very, uh, there's a word for that, like a word that has so many potential meanings, like one of those major words like that has like, could have a hundred different meanings. What does it really mean in that? Allahu Alam. So that word, the tafsir would go. You have, you have, you study that issue, right? Just one other thing I forgot. Yeah. Like, isn't there like an ayah though that says like, you've never written a book before this, and then, uh, like the ayah ends, um, uh, yeah, like, yeah. Be yaminik, yeah. something like that, yeah. And then if you had, then the people who doubt would have doubted, like, after the ayah. Like, yeah, so, so that, so if you believe that he wasn't unlettered, then that would mean that you never previously authored a book. Doesn't mean you don't know how to author a book. It just means you never previously authored a book with your own hands that they could point to and said, this is where you got it from. So that could be one potential meaning of that. But it could also mean if you believe he's unlettered, that you don't know how to write a book with your hands. You not remember anything on this? Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's the way. No, Allah, I'm, I, I don't want to. So, Ma'ana Biqari, Ibn Hajar, Fatul Bari, and Shirakun explains it like in other versions it says, Mada Akra. So, in other versions of that story, it says, What should I read? Like, so read in the name of your Lord. Well, at first it said, Read. Um, Okay, what do I read? That was so it could be that was the question rather than I don't know how to read. So, but yeah, they use that ma'ana. So, and the people who say he's unlettered is based on a conglomerate of all these evidences that seem to suggest he's unlettered. But then there's also another side to that that no, that's not really what it means. So, then you can explain all these things alternately and differently. So, Okay. We're all good. Okay. See you next week for the final class, final week of classes, Rashad. Oh, I haven't even thought about that. What was the exam? Okay. Okay. Hanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh.